Chapters three and four of Book Twelve of Les Miserables, Volume Four, by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martina Hutchins in Berkeley, California. Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Twelve, Corinth. Chapter Three. Night begins to descend upon Grand Serre. The spot was, in fact, admirably adapted. The entrance to the street widened out, the other extremity narrowed together into a pocket without exit. Corinth created an obstacle. The Rue Mondetour was easily barricaded on the right and the left. No attack was possible except from the Rue Saint-Denis, that is to say, in front and in full sight. Bossuet had the comprehensive glance of a fasting Hannibal. Terror had seized on the whole street at the eruption of the mob. There was not a passer-by who did not get out of sight. In the space of a flash of lightning, in the rear, to the right and left, shops, stables, area doors, windows, blinds, attic skylights, shutters of every description were closed from the ground floor to the roof. A terrified old woman fixed a mattress in front of her window on two clothes poles for drying linen in order to deaden the effect of musketry. The wine shop alone remained open, and that for a very good reason, that the mob had rushed into it. "'Ah, oh, my God! Ah, oh, my God!' sighed Mame Hachelot. Bossuet had gone down to meet Corferac. Jolie, who had placed himself at the window, exclaimed, "'Corferac, you ought to have brought an umbrella. You will catch gold!' In the meantime, in the space of a few minutes, Twenty iron bars had been wrenched from the grated front of the wine shop. Ten fathoms of street had been unpaved. Gavroche and Bahorel had seized in its passage and overturned the dray of a lime dealer named Anco. This dray contained three barrels of lime, which they placed beneath the piles of paving stones. And Holras raised the cellar trap and all the widow Hutchelope's empty casks were used to flank the barrels of lime. Fuley, with his fingers skilled in painting the delicate sticks of fans, had backed up the barrels and the dray with two massive heaps of blocks of rough stone, blocks which were improvised like the rest and procured no one knows where. The beams which served as props were torn from the neighboring house front and laid on the casks. When Bossuet and Corferac turned round, half the street was already barred with a rampart higher than a man. There is nothing like the hand of the populace for building everything that is built by demolishing. Matelot and Gibelot had mingled with the workers. Gibelot went and came loaded with rubbish. Her lassitude helped on the barricade. She served the barricade as she had served wine, with a sleepy air. An omnibus with two white horses passed the end of the street. Bossuet strode over the paving stones, ran to it, stopped the driver, made the passengers alight, offered his hand to the ladies, dismissed the conductor, and returned, leading the vehicle and the horses by the bridle. Omnibuses, he said, do not pass the Corinth. Non liquet omnibus adire Corinthum. An instant later, the horses were unharnessed and went off at their will through the Rue Mondetour, and the omnibus lying on its side completed the bar across the street. Mame Hitchelope, quite upset, had taken refuge in the first story. Her eyes were vague and stared without seeing anything, and she cried in a low tone. Her terrified shrieks did not dare emerge from her throat. "'The end of the world has come,' she muttered. Jolie deposited a kiss on Mme. Hochelope's fat, red, wrinkled neck and said to Grantaire, 
my dear fellow i have always regarded a woman's neck as an infinitely delicate thing but Grantaire attained the highest regions of Dithram. Metalot had mounted to the first floor once more. Grantaire seized her round the waist and gave vent to long bursts of laughter at the window. Metalot is homely, he cried. Metalot is a dream of ugliness. Metalot is a chimera. This is the secret of her birth. A gothic Pygmalion, who was making gargoyles for cathedrals, fell in love with one of them, the most horrible, one fine morning. He besought love to give it life, and this produced Metalot. Look at her, citizens. She has chromate of lead-colored hair like Titian's mistress, and she is a good girl. I guarantee she will fight well. Every good girl contains a hero. As for Mother Hutchelot, she's an old warrior. Look at her mustaches. She inherited them from her husband. A hussar, indeed, she will fight too. These two alone will strike terror to the heart of the banlieue. Comrades, we shall overthrow the government as true as there are fifteen intermediary acids between margaric acid and formic acid. However, that is a matter of perfect indifference to me. Gentlemen, my father always detested me because I could not understand mathematics. I understand only love and liberty. I am Grantaire, the good fellow. Having never had any money, I never acquired the habit of it, and the result is that I have never lacked it. But if I have been rich, there would have been no more poor people. You would have seen. Oh, if the kind hearts only had fat purses, how much better things would go. I picture myself Jesus Christ with Rothschild's fortune. How much good he would do. Metalot, embrace me. You are voluptuous and timid. You have cheeks which invite the kiss of a sister, and lips which claim the kiss of a lover. Hold your tongue, you cask, said Corferac. Grantier retorted, I am the capitule and the master of the floral game. And Holros, who was standing on the crest of the barricade, gun in hand, raised his beautiful austere face. And Holros, as the reader knows, has something of the Spartan and of the Puritan in his composition. He would have perished at Thermopylae and Leonidas, and burned at Drogheda and Cromwell. Grantaire, he shouted, go get rid of the fumes of your wine somewhere else than here. This is the place for enthusiasm, not for drunkenness. Don't disgrace the barricade. This angry speech produced a singular effect on Grantaire. One would have said that he had had a glass of cold water flung in his face. He seemed to be rendered suddenly sober. He sat down, put his elbows on a table near the window, looked at Enholras with indescribable gentleness, and said to him, Let me sleep here. Go and sleep somewhere else, cried Enholras. But Grantier, still keeping his tender and troubled eyes fixed on him, replied, Let me sleep here until I die. And Holros regarded him with disdainful eyes. Grantaire, you are incapable of believing, of thinking, of willing, of living, and of dying. Grantaire replied in a grave tone, You will see. He stammered a few more unintelligible words, then his head fell heavily on the table, and, as is the usual effect of the second period of inebriety, into which Enholras had roughly and abruptly thrust him an instant later, he had fallen asleep. Chapter 4 An Attempt to Console the Widow Hutchelope Baharel, in ecstasies over the barricade, shouted, Here's the street in its low-necked dress. How well it looks! Corferac, as he demolished the wine shop to some extent, sought to console the widowed proprietress. Mother Hutchelope, weren't you complaining the other day? because you had had a notice served on you for infringing the law, because Gibelot shook a counterpane out of your window? Yes, my good Monsieur Coferac. Ah, good heavens! Are you going to put the table of mine in your horror, too? And it was for the counterpane, and also for the pot of flowers which fell from the attic window into the street, that the government collected a fine of a hundred francs. If that isn't an abomination, what is? Well, Mother Hutchelope, we are avenging you. 
Mother Hutchelope did not appear to understand very clearly the benefit which she was to derive from the reprisals made on her account. She was satisfied after the manner of that Arab woman, who, having received a box on the ear from her husband, went to complain to her father, and cried for vengeance, saying, Father, you owe my husband a front for a front. The father asked, On which cheek did you receive the blow? On the left cheek. The father slapped her right cheek and said, Now you are satisfied. Go tell your husband that he boxed my daughter's ears, and I have accordingly boxed his wife's. The rain had ceased. Recruits had arrived. Workmen had brought under their blouses a barrel of powder, a basket containing bottles of vitriol, two or three carnival torches, and a basket filled with fire pots, left over from the King's Festival. This festival was very recent, having taken place on the 1st of May. It was said that these munitions came from a grocer in the Faubourg Saint-Antoine named Pepin. They smashed the only street lantern in the Rue de la Chanvierie, the lantern corresponding to one in the Rue Saint-Denis, and all the lanterns in the surrounding street, de Mondeture, de Signes, de Précieuses, and de la grande and de la petite trou de terre. And Horace, Combeferre, and Courfeyrac directed everything. Two barricades were now in the process of construction at once, both of them resting on the corn house and forming a right angle. The larger shut off the rue de la Chanverie, the other closed the rue Mondeteur on the side of the rue de Signe. This last barricade, which was very narrow, was constructed only of casts and paving stones. There were about fifty workers on it. Thirty were armed with guns. Four on their way, they had effected a wholesale loan from an armorer's shop. Nothing could be more bizarre, and at the same time more motley, than this troop. One had a round jacket, a cavalry saver, and two holster pistols. Another was in his shirt sleeves with a round hat and a powder horn slung at his side. A third wore a plastron of nine sheets of gray paper and was armed with a saddler's awl. There was one who was shouting, Let us exterminate them to the last man and die at the point of our bayonet. This man had no bayonet. Another spread out his coat, the cross belt and cartridge box of a National Guardsman, the cover of a cartridge box being ornamented with this inscription in red worsted public order there were a great many guns bearing the numbers of the legions few hats no cravats many bare arms some pikes add to this all ages all sorts of faces small pale young men and bronzed longshoremen all were in haste and as they helped each other they discussed the possible chances that they would receive succor about three o'clock in the morning they were sure of one regiment that paris would rise terrible sayings with which was mingled a sort of cordial joviality one would have pronounced them brothers but they did not know each other's names great perils have this fine characteristic that they bring to light the fraternity of strangers a fire had been lighted in the kitchen and there they were engaged in moulding into bullets pewter mugs spoons forks and all the brass tableware of the establishment in the midst of it all they drank caps and buckshot were mixed pell-mell on the tables with glasses of wine in the billiard hall mame hutchelope matelote and gibelot variously modified by terror which had stupefied one rendered another breathless and roused the third were tearing up old dishcloths and making lint three insurgents were assisting them three bushy-haired jolly blades with beards and moustaches who plucked away at the linen with fingers of seamstresses and who made them tremble the man of lofty stature whom corfrac colmethier and enholroth had observed at the moment when he joined the mob at the corner of the rue des billets was at work on the small barricade and was making himself useful there gavroche was working on the larger one as for the young man who had been waiting for Corfrac at his lodgings and who had inquired 
for Monsieur Marius. He had disappeared at about the time when the omnibus had been overturned. Gavroche, completely carried away and radiant, had undertaken to get everything in readiness. He went, came, mounted, descended, remounted, whistled, and sparkled. He seemed to be there for the encouragement of all. Had he any incentive? Yes, certainly, his poverty. Had he wings? Yes, certainly, his joy. Gavroche was a whirlwind. He was constantly visible. He was incessantly audible. He filled the air as he was everywhere at once. He was a sort of almost irritating ubiquity. No halt was possible with him. The enormous barricade felt him on its haunches. He troubled the loungers. He excited the idle. He reanimated the weary. He grew impatient over the thoughtful. He inspired gaiety in some, and breath in others, wrath in others, movement in all. Now pricking a student, now biting an artisan, he alighted, paused, flew off again, hovered over the tumult, and the effort sprang from one party to another, murmuring and humming and harassing the whole company, a fly on the immense revolutionary coach. Perpetual motion was in his little arms, and perpetual clamor in his little lungs. Courage! More paving stones, more cats, more machines! Where are you now? A hod of plaster for me to stop this hole with. Your barricade is very small. It must be carried up. Put everything on it. Bling everything there. Stick it all in. Break down the house. A barricade is Mother Gibault's tea. Hello, here's a glass door. This elicited an exclamation from the workers. A glass door? What do you expect us to do with a glass door, Tubercle? Hercules yourselves, retorted Gavroche. A glass door is an excellent thing in a barricade. It does not prevent an attack, but it prevents the enemy taking it, so you're never prigged apples over a wall when there are broken bottles. A glass door cuts the horns of the National Guard when they try to mount the barricade. Pardi, glass is a treacherous thing. Well, you haven't a very wildly lively imagination, comrades. However, he was furious over his triggerless pistol. He went from one to another, demanding, A gun! I want a gun! Why don't you give me a gun? Give you a gun, said Combeferre. Come now, said Gavroche. Why not? I had one in 1830 when we had a dispute with Charles X. And Holrush shrugged his shoulders. When there are enough for men, we'll give some to the children. Gavroche wheeled round haughtily and answered, If you are killed before me, I shall take yours. Gammon, said Unholrus. Greenhorn, said Gavroche. A dandy who had lost his way and who lounged past the end of the street created a diversion. Gavroche shouted to him, Come with us, young fellow. Well now, don't we do anything for this old country of ours? The dandy fled. End of Book Twelve, Chapter Four Recording by Martina Hutchins in Berkeley, California